And we are here to talk about Becky by Gene Toomer today, which is an excerpt actually from his revolutionary 1923 novel, Kane. Coming up. Becky. Becky, 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 Becky. Did you ever wonder why he chose that name? It's interesting. Not Rebecca, not Becca, not Beck. <laughs> Becky. The informal Becky. Welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I am Becky. <laughs> I'm Crypto. <laughs> if you are new to the Codex Cantina, we take a conversational approach to the stories that we read, tackling some of the most important literature that has influenced even today's writers. If you're down for a conversation like that, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off with publication information. And as Una mentioned, the book Kane, written by Gene Toomer, was published in 1923. We'll leave a link down in the description below where you can read and listen for free. Kane is considered the pinnacle of the hard renaissance by many and is regarded as the first modernist book by a black author and there is some debate to that because tumor himself did not want to be considered a black author at the time period and so his peers kind of categorized or pushed him into you know this box so to speak and he himself just wanted to be considered an american author and there's even more controversy there, too, because he was a passing black author, too. Some say how much he accepted about his black heritage is questionable. But let's talk about this today, because this is kind of what we would call a short story cycle. It's a bunch of short stories. It's not a collection where they're all disparate, though, because there is connection between all of them. And today we're going to put our blinders on, because we didn't read the entire Kane novel for today's discussion, and just talk about Becky in this box and say, what did this mean? mean and what are some of the themes of the story yeah i think this is the fourth quote story in the book and it's a vignette because there is poetry and other types of stories in in the book kane okay now for plot becky is a white woman that is cast out by the community because she has two black sons the townspeople kind of build her this cabin they take care of her give her food but they never really interact with her or see her now, what happens is that as the boys can't grow up, they're kind of causing trouble, they leave, uh, cursed by both races in the town, and when Becky's chimney collapses as she lives between the railroad tracks and the road, uh, she's buried and someone kind of throws a Bible onto the rubble. So, not really a plot piece so much, but more of kind of like a, a fictionary tale for us to kind of discuss today. Wow, she's condemned twice. <laughs> it's kind of heartbreaking. It's brutal, and I think that's where we kind of got to start out, is whose story is this? Because... Because the title's called Becky, right? So you assume this is going to be Becky's story, but it's not told from her point of view. And I don't even know, I mean, Becky is the subject, but is that really what we should be focusing on? Because I wonder how much of this we should be thinking about the town in this situation. You'll notice that the narration is a collective pronoun. We think this. And it... it bounces back and forth between we as the town but then also we the black side of town and we the white side of town and kind of dives into how they may think differently i think that becky is just going to be the plot device for the story and then as you said the town is the actual main character it's their story of what they're doing to this woman and her sons and what they're not doing or how they're interacting with one another how they're secretly behaving and what that says about them as a people and i think that that was kind of the point that tumor is trying to make here is what do we do as a person in society what would do we do secretly and how do we judge each other based on things like skin color yeah the gaze of the town is very important and you'll notice too the town thinks that she's dead before she's even dead right as soon as she has uh, a second child of mixed race the town just completely outcasts her they stick her in between the tracks and in the the road and uh just basically don't even acknowledge her existence but they still take care of her interestingly enough and this is something that tumor himself might have experienced or definitely heard about from his parents because in the south during the time period there were jim crow laws that prohibited it was actually illegal for white and black people to get married and i think that uh, a lot of this was done because they thought it was good but it also they were trying to protect the, race, the, the, the mixed child because neither side of each community would accept them. The black community shunned the children. The white community shunned the children. And so Toomer himself as an individual that comes from a mixed marriage, I think is trying to explore what it was like for people during the early 20th century in the, in the South, particularly Georgia. So the theme is really interesting as you bring up this divide 
right? Because she lived in between the tracks and the road. Uh, her house was shook when the trains went by. And there's even that quote how, as the horses and buggies passed, no one ever saw her. So immediately, even from the firstborn, we had that quote, when the first was born, the white folks said they'd have no more to do with her. And the black folks, they too joined hands to cast her out. But as we talked about earlier, they cast her out because both of them kind of condemn her situation for their own reasons, right? They, they are not agreeing to kind of accept the other side. But then at the same time, they still help her out. Yeah, this is something that was kind of puzzling to me was, all right, so publicly, they're all shaming her. They build her this house. You're not allowed to live in town because you have a child with a black man, and we're not going to accept that. But when she's in need, they bring her food, they take care of her. So why are they doing this? Why are they feeling an obligation to take care of Becky? Not necessarily her children. It says that they're taking care of her and indirectly, they're taking care of the children. Why would they do that? I almost felt complicit in the judgment of her. I feel like judgment has to be in the discussion here because we as a reader are powerless, much like many people maybe felt at this time that they were unable to stop some of the discrimination and problems of the South. Yeah, sure. So this way, they're able to do it secretly and feel better about themselves, at least personally privately, you know, and they know that publicly they can still fit in with the rest of their friends and family. It's kind of heartbreaking on all sides. Not that to say that what they're doing is correct or that you should feel bad for them, but maybe you can see why they feel what they feel or it, it's a justification for their actions. And I think that's part of the story here is that we should be judging this situation specifically. I kind of feel like the whole, I mean, we can't ignore the whole Bible, in this situation, right? It was alluded to several times. They talked about uh, they wish that God would basically pass judgment on Becky, on, on the town even. So clearly, I think that they're bringing the Bible in this story to almost have that discussion of judgment as well. Which is a really tough thing to swallow, right? Because there there's seven different avenues you can go down with this. Obviously, it depends on your interpretation of the Bible, depends on which books of the Bible you're going to be using. And then there's also the thing of that, you know, are you going through Christ's teachings of, he says, you know, you should accept everybody and those that without sin can cast the first stone. And here they are going against his teachings, but they're still trying to justify what they're doing through the use of their religion. Well, I feel like even to reverse that, so not even to put it on the town, but to put it on Becky, Becky is kind of the martyr in this situation, that she's the one that's being... Uh, the, the one that's suffering for everyone else's sins. She's taking on the sins of others that she kind of has, I don't want to say a Jesus-like journey, right? I mean, she does have a child out of wedlock, uh, but we don't really know much about her. Like you said, she's a plot device, and we don't even know anything much about the dad other than he's black. We, we don't know what the relationship was like them, but we see how the sins of the fathers, in a sense, come on to the children, right? The, the two children are the ones that are outcasts that suffer from this. And uh, to me, it's kind of like that cyclical thing of this thing has to kind of stop because we could see the harm that it's causing to the, to, to the children. If you go down this religious route, I think it's easy to start pulling in some parallels with the Jesus journey. She's basically crucified at the end by the town, you know, and killed. And what do they throw on the rubble of the town that she was pinned underneath? A Bible. Uh, you know, she has two sons. A lot of characters in the Bible have two sons. And she dies twice, too, right? The town considered her dead on the second kid, resurrected, yep. and then dies again at the end. And then she lives on, you know, her her essence lives on through her two sons who have basically, you know, forsaken her as well. There, there's a lot of biblical parallels here, I think, which just reinforces uh, what Toomer was trying to do of you can't necessarily be super religious and still behave this way. I think is maybe one of the arguments he's trying to make here in this fictional story. Maybe even a little good um, young Goodman Brown effect in a sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I could see that. So I would love to see more of, I, I, we need to do the entirety of Kane. I feel like, because the, the ongoing themes, we're not getting some of those conversations that probably need to be brought into this, but by itself, because interestingly enough, this is brought to me out of an anthology where someone picked it up and thought that this could be read on its own, and I think it can. I just imagine that this would be enriched 
by picking up the rest of this book, Cain. I would like to know more about the, the children. Is there more about their story in the other, you know, poetry and, and vignettes and stories and whatever plays are in the rest of the book? I, the, does he explore what happens to them? I think that could tell you a lot about uh, Becky herself as well, because I think that, you know, we are sometimes who our parents are and that could be you know did becky try to raise them as good people you know they were making trouble and they, they got in a little bit of trouble but there's just that you know is that that old saying of boys being boys or were they good were they bad i think that we could draw a lot out from becky's character if we had more interactions with the people around her than just this town so to speak you know what i think we should do i think what we should do is like once a month do one of the cycles out of this book because I, I was really impressed with Gene Toomer's writings. We're kind of moving into our personal wrap up and ratings, which very subjective should mean nothing to you other, other than if you're looking for our opinion on it, it's not an objective review, but I was really impressed with Toomer's writing in this enough to, to feel compelled that we, we, we really need to probably dig more into his work. I don't know if we have two years, uh, you know, mapped out for us already or not. <laughs> wink, wink. I do know that uh, because there, there, there are two large sections to this book and it would take us, I think, you know, if we did it that slow, it would take us probably a couple of years to get through. So maybe we'd be a little bit more picky and choosy on some of the specific stories to help, you know, round out Becky's story, but give us more understanding of Gene Toomer, his life and his view of, you know, the 1920s in, in Georgia at the time period and how that affected him and, and his belief system. But uh, yeah, this is a, a top-notch un story, another story that is really going home to try to teach you about the diversity of race relations in the early 20th century in the southern United States, and and he knocks it out of the park like so many authors before. I'm going to give this one a solid 8.5 out of 10. Yeah, I think I'm going to skip the ratings. I, I really want to see this contextually in, in the entirety of Kane. I really do. But it's enough for me, if you're looking for like a, hey, should I check this out? I, I was blown away by the story I, I really enjoyed it we have to get more into gene tumor so with that said guys if you're down for literature discussions like what we're doing right now hit that subscribe button to join us on the journey as we post videos every monday and thursday with a bonus video on tuesdays una out peace